know, the language of food. How many of you have studied a little bit the language of food? Nobody? Nothing? How many of you have an interest in the language of food? Oh, what type of interest? Academic, culinary, um, social? Okay, so the language of food is a little bit of everything. This is what I'm going to talk to you about today. The presentation is not by all means a scientific one, it's not an academic one, it's practical, fun, and hopefully entertaining. So let's start with the first one. As you can see here, the language of food, it's a vast topic with multiple and diverse levels to be explored. First of all, it's the linguistic one. How do you define language in the con context of food? Is it denotative? Is it a motive? What does it mean? And by uh, saying uh, denotative, I mean the purely description of a dish according to the dictionary. A motive, as you can see, is more like the emotional reaction to what we eat and what we see in front of us. Then you have the social level. Is language a social connector or is it a divider? Does it connect us or divide us? Is that uh, language and our social culinary level good for our relationships or not? And are we foodies, and I hate this word foodies, but it actually for this um, context, it's actually, it's quite good to use it here. Do we belong to the same group of people? We share the same knowledge and interest about food? Are you comfortable, all of you, reading a menu that doesn't really mean anything to you when everybody else gets excited? How do you feel about that? How do you feel going in, in a restaurant that someone else takes you there and you don't really want to go and you don't feel comfortable because it's expensive and you don't like the food? So that affects our relationships. Then we'll have the financial level, how much we can afford to pay for food. So what is the definition of cheap versus expensive? You know, um, based on the work I do, because I work as a food consultant the last six, seven years, and I do market research um, for market research companies looking at different products in the US market, because I'm based in the US, everything related to food, from food producers, manufacturers, restaurants, supermarkets, everybody, they make and they sell food, and their objective is one, it's profit. This is why they do it. So if you sit in a nice restaurant with a nice menu that is colorful and fancy, da da da, they think they want from you is your money. Yes, they sell you good food, expensive food, fancy food, but the, the, the goal is to make a profit. And that affects everything, the, the why they design the menus, the way they design the menus, the, the commercials you see every day, the packaged food, we're gonna go through everything together. So the description of food in menus, packaged foods, boards, presses, advertising, is intended to attract sales. And the last level is the political level, one of the last ones. This is what we're gonna to talk to, to you uh, today. So, um, because I'm based in the US, I'm going to talk to you about what is going on in the US right now. We have a lot of clean food label discussions, if food is FDA approved, we'll talk about the diplomacy of food, food as a political domination, and I'll show you some examples how governments and um, agencies, government agencies, they kind of play with that. So, let's start. We're going to talk about menus, today, recipes, packaged foods, and everything else I'm gonna throw uh, in the slides. You're gonna see some photos and I'm gonna have some quizzes for you. If you know the answer, you are welcome to reply, to answer it. If you don't know, please don't Google. You can Google afterwards. So this is the first photo I want to show you. What do you see here? Bananas, where are the bananas from? See, can you see on top it says? Aussie bananas. And that's a photo I took last year I went to Australia for the first time. And this is a photo in a supermarket in Hobart, Hobart uh, Tasmania. So although I don't think they produce bananas in Tasmania, they kind of use the local production and they, this is what they sell. I don't know if there are any Australians in the audience. I have to say that was one of the countries that I went that I was really impressed or shocked or surprised with this kind of focus on food nationalism. Everything is product produced in Australia, everything. Like the next one. This is mussels. What does it say here? This is from Sydney, the fish market in Sydney. Bloom mussels, Nicholas seafood, 
product of Australia, $8.50. Probably in Iceland that would be uh, 20,000 coronas. But so both of them, they kind of emphasize the fact that the food is produced in Australia, right? And usually, f um, like um, f fruit and vegetables, they have a little label that you can see where the food comes from. In Australia, everything was like a big Aussie bananas and grown in Australia and produced in Australia. One day, I was in the supermarket and I was kind of window shopping or looking around, and there was a woman who actually went to the supermarket manager and complained what she couldn't find locally produced cucumbers or lettuces. <laughs> and the supermarket manager explained, yeah, you know, we have them in Australia, but we need more, so we have to import food, you know? And she said, oh, you can't get them all in Australia? I said, no, you can't. We have to get some food from other countries. So this is kind of like food and politics, food and uh, an expression of government, um, government selection, and, you know, it's not a bad thing, but it's an interesting thing. So, who is the audience of the language of food? Everybody, all of us. Consumers, readers, lawyers, poets, writers, journalists, teachers, chefs, artists, children, very interesting children. They look at food more than adults lately. Polyglots, obviously. <laughs> and we're gonna start looking at the menus first. And the first one you're gonna see is a video. I don't want you to look only into the food, just look into the description of the dishes, okay? Um, I'm gonna, gonna play the video. Make some notes if you want to. And that's only for the tasting menu, obviously. Yeah. If you add wine and service fee, it's probably be 400, even more, maybe. So, what do you think of that? Do you think that the average, by the way, this is the 11 Park Avenue, um, Madison Avenue restaurant, that it was voted the best restaurant in the world in 2017. What do you think that the average American goes to that restaurant and has this $300 to go, understands the menu? Yes, no, maybe? Uh, I think so. Do you, do you um, as polyglots, uh, you know, because you have knowledge of different languages or the roots of languages, can you really understand everything in the menu? Most of it. 
most of it. I, I think so too. So I picked a few dishes, not all of them. What is the picky toe crab? Mm, polyglots, they don't know. I didn't know myself, so I have to do some research. Picky toe crab, it's a very small, unique crab grown in Maine, in East Coast. And the fact that it's in various tasting menus of top restaurants in the US is because um, it needs to be cleaned, basically get the crab and you get the meat out and then you have to ship it to restaurants because it's very fragile and that makes it very expensive. This is what is picky dog crab. Uh, any other word that maybe creates some problems, like confit, French? How many Americans actually know confit, even the ones who have the money? Um, do you know what confit is? Kind of, right? Okay, we're not gonna explain everything. Um, Torchon with pain de pisse and maple syrup. Very French, huh? Foie gras. I still wonder why pain de pisse is an uppercase. I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, they make a mistake. I don't know why pain de pisse is an uppercase. Um, what of the dishes you think you would like to try in that restaurant? <laughs> All of them. I think I like to try the first one. Oh, the other one I didn't mention, the cyclone pig. It's a nice trend in the US food language the last 10, 50 years to use the word pig instead of raw, of raw pork. Uh, I don't know why, to make it bold, to make it more real. I don't know why they do that, but they, you can see it in different tasting menus and different menus of various restaurants to, go, to use the word pig. So what do you think of the languages here? Is like descriptive, denotative, emotive? What type of language is this? Esoteric. <laughs> Esoteric. It's, uh, I don't know, I think it's a language that fits probably a top restaurant in a country. This is how it's used, a little bit of English, a little bit of French, a combination of two. And this is what someone with money that goes to that restaurant expects to find, I think. The next one I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna compare maybe a little bit, it's for another top restaurant, the French Laundry, which is in California. Three Michelin stars, it started in 1978 with Thomas Keller, one of the very first tasting menu restaurants in the country. This is even worse. This is, in my opinion, a very crowded menu. There's too much information, too much description. It's kind of, you go to eat or you go to have a language class, I don't know. Uh, so I, I still, still don't get why there are quotation marks in different dishes, but I can't find the pattern why. So for example, the first one have oysters and pearls. It's in English. Some other ones they have, it's in French, like uh, which the one, or uh, a cappella, which is not only French, it's like a type of cheese made in Wisconsin. Um, Roti à la uh, broche, another one in quoting, quoting marks, quotation marks. And everything that I put in red, it's what? It's what? It's places. They want you to know where the food comes from, which is actually quite interesting. Transparency in the menu. Even if you pay another $300 for that, you need to know where the food comes from. So those restaurants, because they cater a very high-end clientele most of the time, celebrities, uh, millionaires, billionaires, blah, 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 uh, they kind of make it more transparent. So it's a little bit political, a little bit linguistic linguistic, a little bit of social. Um, so you know that the moulard d'ac for gras terrain comes from Hudson Valley, you know that the figs are from uh, Jacobson Orchards, you know that the yellow tail is Pacific, and different other things, the know the stony green lobster, alba truffles. <laughs> the interesting thing is the most plain is the dessert. There's nothing much there, it's like fruit, ice cream, um, chocolate, and candies. So, how many Americans actually you think they understand what they eat from that menu? Very few, I think. Even if you have the money to spend, I don't think that you necessarily know what you eat and what everything is. Um, because there is also a lot of French and this and that and thrown words. Uh, I mean, you have all sorts of different sabayan, you have... What is la, la, uh, la rat potato? It's a type of potato, uh, small white potato. Do you like this menu? The way it's described and presented, not to try it. <laughs> hmm? I agree that it's a kind of busy menu. 
yeah, it's very busy. I think they could they could do it better, I think, but for some reason they don't. So I said in the beginning that I'm gonna stay in the US, but I was cheating a little bit because I read the posting on the Polyglot Facebook site about restaurants in Reykjavik. And there was a woman saying that um, she goes to Snaps every week. If the woman is here, you can raise your hand because Snaps is like a nice gourmet restaurant in Reykjavik, but it's not so cheap. And then there was another one saying that, oh, if you're going to have cheap food, go to Ikea Cantina, which I don't want to go to have Ikea meatballs. So I found a menu and it's two pages. I'm going to say, show you the website from a gastropub. I don't know if you went, anyone went to that one. It's from the Semondur Gastropub, Kex Hostel, I think it is, within the Kex Hostel. And I copy and paste from, I copy and paste from their website. What do you see here? You see a description of the food. I only paste, copy and paste the hamburger and other bread stuff, which I like bread stuff. It's very specific. It's not very specific. So again, quotation marks here, Freedom Burger. What does it mean? Freedom Burger. It doesn't have any pesticides. It's good food, good meat, what? They describe everything. Also, they add the location where the food comes from, from Dobby at Hals. And then also the price that we didn't have in the other two menus. Why we didn't have, well, actually we had it in the first one. Because the taste menu, the price come at the end as a whole, you pay for the whole thing. Here you pay for each dish. So you have baked goat cheese. You see a spelling mistake here? That's actually copy and paste from the website. So the grilled brioche is not so grilled and not so brioche. There is an E missing from brioche and an E missing from grilled. Um, um, what else they have here? The next page is roasted pumpkin soup, peanut salad, another mistake here, salad. Roasted, mistake again. So even if they offer the English version of the menu, there are some little mistakes that they could improve, I think. Um, do you like this menu? I mean, the website is more interesting. This is kind of boring, but you like it. You can go. I think I kind of want to go to that place and try some. <laughs> Yeah. 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 That's why they, they have it. Because some restaurants, I notice they don't have anything in English. They have only Icelandic. So I said before that we're all audiences of the food industry: restaurants, uh, um, products in supermarkets, cookbooks, and everything. And everybody's involved, included poets. So I'm not going to play the audio because the audio is difficult to play, but I'm going to read you the transcript. There is a show in the US called onbeing.org. The host and the producer is Krista Tippett, a journalist. Um, she interviews everybody. Uh, she interviews, I don't want to see it yet. She interviews um, poets, authors, scientists, spiritual leaders, uh, physicians, and they talk about everything. They talk from uh, religion to food and language, so she interviewed... Um, so here's something. Oh, oh, no, that's... I'm not going to play the whole thing. Uh, I'm going to read that. So I'm Crystal Tippin, this is on being. Today I'm with the poet Mary Hu at the Benedictine Monastery and College of St. Joseph, Minnesota. She's a former poet laureate of New York who is speaking about family, religion, the rituals of ordinary life, and the mystery of language, all of which cover coverage in her work. So she asks, real time is a new invented phrase. And the poet says, it's true, we didn't used to call it. We never talked about real time. And then she says, it's like when you go to those restaurants and they say, homemade food, in quotes, homemade. It's right. Well, it's like, well, isn't all food homemade? We actually cooked. Yeah, real time, it's true. There is redundancy. I mean, that's happening now. And sometimes the language of food is redundant, like homemade food. It's another term to use to prove that your food is good. Homemade? I don't know. What do you think? Do you need to use the word homemade in restaurants? Not really. Because where else we can cook it? Yes, there are some chains that they get the food from different suppliers, but they still cook it in the restaurant. Not, your mother doesn't cook your food, but you know, you, you have to make it uh, on premise. What is this question? What is this? 
Can you? Huh? No, it's not Icelandic. It's, it was invented in, in Australia, but now it's made in the US and maybe other countries. It's a hybrid dessert. Well, yeah, it's a hybrid dessert. Like the cronut, from, you know the cronut, right? Cronut, croissant and donut, called cronut. This is very similar. You don't know, do you? Huh? No. It, look, it looks like a muffin, but it's made with the dough of a croissant. So it's a cruffin, C-R-U-F-F-I-N. It was invented at the uh, Loon Bakery in Melbourne, and I went there. I had the last one, actually, that day, because you had to wait in a huge line, and I was there. Ooh, the last one. And then they copied the recipe, other bakeries all over the world, I guess, mostly in the US, and uh, I haven't seen it in any European capital, at least. So this is the cruffin in New York. Hmm? Hybrid foods, new words, crafting, donut. Um, there was another one with coffee and something else. I don't remember the word. So crafting. So from the menus that they have some interest, we're going to go to recipes that, in my opinion, are not quite boring. The uh, North American, English, Anglo-Saxonic cookbooks recipes are by 98% use the imperative form. Do this, do that, cut the onions, fry the eggs, boil the potatoes, da, da, da. You feel like you're going to military camp. Uh, but this is food, you know. If you go in a restaurant and see all the cooks cooking, this is like being like a soldier. Do, do, do. And now I think we need the help of the technician to show us the first recipe, if the technician is there. The first one is from a website called allrecipes.com. And you're going to see it. So this is a website that, where did it go? Oh, yeah, here it is. I can't see it, but I'll see it here. It's a website that everybody can send the recipe. And then, I don't know how they pick and choose. They put it online, and they, you actually uh, show your ingredients and your directions. And some people make it. Some people like it. So basically, you see here the ingredients. Uh, pay attention, because I'm going to ask you a question, question after that. And the directions, all imperative form. Do this, do that. Huh? They give you the time, uh, the prep time, and the total time. Um, what do you think of that recipe, in terms of language? Hmm? Very simple, very simple, very easy to make. Uh, okay, and let's go to the next one. The next one is from um, bonappetit.com, which is a kind of a glossy magazine and also a large website that you can get all sorts of recipes. This is another apple pie. Oh, I've forgotten the name. What, this is an apple pie with spiced apple caramel sauce. The other was an apple pie, granny's apple pie. So you see, this is longer, right? Ingredients, da, da, da. And then the assembly further down. What is the difference between the two, except for the um, length? Well, in this one, I don't know if you pay attention to the other one, they give you actually, you have to make the crust. The other one is a frozen crust that you have to use. So this is a little bit more complicated. I want to say that both allrecipes.com and bonappetit.com, they test the recipe on site. And because all those magazines, they have kitchens and you test, they just don't give it to your public and um, you know um, consumers and audiences just like that. They test the recipe before. So another simple recipe, right? You see all the cups, the American way of presenting recipes, cups, and have you ever translated any recipes in any of your languages? I think recipe translation is quite difficult because you have also to localize it. You have to um, change the measurement units from country to country, continent to continent. Um, all recipes, local.com, they localize the recipes in 10, 15 languages. And because they're based in Seattle, and I'm based in Seattle too, I met them and they said that when they localize, they don't only localize the language, they localize the recipe. And usually all the American recipes localized in other, any other language or country, for other countries obviously, they cut the sugar in half. That tells you. So this is the proper localization. Next one. So as you see, the recipes are 
instructions. Do this, do that, cut the onion. It's a unique way to teach the imperative form if you teach languages. Otherwise, uh, the next one. So th those are the modern ways of presenting recipes today, 2017, and the last 20, 30 years. But before, this is the recipe that was written in 1964. So you have here, when you buy the, it's like a story. When you buy the veal, tell the butcher he should cut it nice and thin and pound it in a little bit. Then, if he's not too busy, he can also cut it up in four-inch pieces. And if he's too busy, you'll cut it yourself. <laughs> I, like, I like the patronizing style. Yes, it's not in parenting form, but it's equally instructive and patronizing, maybe a little bit more than it should. Then it use, of course, melt the margarine, and, 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 and then when it's good and brown, take it out from the pan and keep it warm. Next, you can pour it. So it uses different ways, imperative form, the you, and the should, and um, also has some ifs, if this and if that. So it's a kind of more like a little story, right? And then at the end it says, this will make plenty for four people. They should, they should live and be well. They should live and be well. Okay, and this is from the, this book, the Italian kosher cookbook by Ruth and Bob Grossman, published in 1964. Old, older. There is another book, the Culinary Art Institute Encyclopedia Cookbook, that was published in the 40s. This is an interesting book too. There are, it's a big one, I have this one actually, this is my photo for my book. It's a big one, it probably have been written, has been written for housewives at that time. And they have recipes, but they have little photos, black and white photos, and a little poem next to them, and they tell you something. So this one. Surprise the folks with day not bread, and serve with a variety of mild cheese bread. So it's a little rhyme, so we can go together with the recipe. The next one is even worse. So it's a failed bread. <laughs> if the oven is too slow, the crust will be pale, and the texture will be porous. So it's sure to fail. So you know, it's a nice way to give information about something that it's not positive. So this is what happened with the recipes. I don't know all, what happens in cookbooks in all languages of the world, but I think it's a kind of clean cut thing. Do this, do that. Maybe you should this, maybe you should that, if it's more like a story. Um, so I think the recipes can be used for teaching material, if you want to teach languages, some forms, imperative form, um, yeah, engage students in the classroom. They overall like recipes. I, I know I had a student, I used to teach her French, and every week she wanted another recipe, saying, you know, this is the only thing we're gonna do. I, I was bored after one. <laughs> can we do something else? Okay, first quiz, what is fa? Vietnamese noodle soup, good. And what is the difference with ramen? There are three main differences. Yeah, one is fa is rice noodles, ramen is wheat. Although that is changing because of the gluten-free thing. Um, what, uh, what else? Very good. Pork is ramen, beef is fa, and there is another one. <laughs> they're both very expensive. Uh, I think they're both, I don't think they're extremely expensive. I think it's about, in the US, less than $10 per soup. Really? Hmm. Uh, the other difference is beef, pork, uh, and then the broth. One is made with, I think the broth in ramen is not, the, the fire is cle clearer, the other one is kind of brownish. Okay, so you know, that's good. Let's do packaged foods now, which is my favorite. And I have a lime version here, I'm gonna show you a package. Packaged foods are complicated. So this one, this is for, um, in the language of packaged food, it can be a tricky one. Super bites, roasted red pepper. What do you see? That's the front of the snack. What do you see here? The white bean, brown rice, quinoa, lentil, chia and some other information at the bottom. Basically, they show you the ingredients, right? So you get it and you see in front of you what it's made from. And if you turn the other way, you see on top all the little signs. G, F, U, do you understand all the signs? G, F is gluten-free, the U is kosher, 
Uh, it's corn free. Uh, what else is vegan? You have all those little signs that they are not truly linguistic. It's the kind of the semiotics of packaged food and all those nutrition facts so we can read it and the ingredients at the bottom. They're not too many. Uh, do you think that this will classify under the clean label package? Good. Because of the clean label, clean label that they, they should tell you what is the food is made from. And ideally, the food should have not too many ingredients, just to be clean, few, few good ones. Hmm? I think it's clean label, no? It's quite clean. It's not very crowded, it's not very busy. And they tell you all the non GMO, GF in the first page, I mean, the first, the, 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 the front. What about the other one? Munchies, the ultimate cheddar. What do you see here? So munchies, they have all those three things inside them. The cheaters, the gold, the, the roll gold and the squares. Uh, snack mix, nothing much in the front page, in the, in the cover, the, the, the front, except that there's a new look, it looks new. I don't know what looks new. If you go to the back, look how many ingredients they have. This is that you can see the um, produce good genetic engineering. You can see that in a lot of snack food in the US the last year or two. Basically, all the corporate big brands, they produce good genetic engineer, and they tell you that. So you know. So if you eat those, you know that the corn probably is uh, GMO. Uh, maybe the wheat, too. I don't know. what. They don't tell you which ingredient is GMO, but they tell you. And the first time I saw it, I think it was an energy bar, kind of cereal bar I saw it, or potato chips, I don't know. When I said, oh my God, this is genetic engineering. Oh, they tell you, at least they tell you. I appreciate that. Next one, this is what we see every day, almost every day, every week. Clean label, the new changes to the nutrition facts labels, according to the, F, um, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, they announced that they're gonna change the labeling until 2020, all food manufacturers, they have to comply. Um, and that means that if you want to sell your food, even if you make it in your kitchen or in commercial kitchen and you sell it in a farmer's market or in a local little shop, if you want to go nationwide in big supermarkets, you have to have all those labels. And you have to say what, how much is, Carbs, protein, da da da, everything. And if GMO, you have to say that. Another one, every day, I'm telling you. Special report, consumer and clean food. What is clean label trend going next? Uh, there are all sorts of webinars. I'm going to do a webinar next week about that too. Just curious to see what X, what is going to happen. Another one, hippies. What they're made from, the hippies? Hippies. From chickpeas. It's chickpeas, puffs. They play a little bit of P. It's chickpea, it's not really P. This company announced that they're gonna get $10 million investment to expand. They do pretty well. I guess everybody likes peas or chickpeas, I don't know. Next one, this one, Happy Belly. The Happy Belly, it's the private label of Amazon.com. As you know, Amazon does everything, including food these days. And they developed their own food label. Happy Belly and another one. Happy Belly, they only have um, snacks and nut, nuts mixes like this one, uh, the tropical trail mix and the cashews, fancy cashews, um, teas, coffee, and uh, some spices. I like the packaging. Do you like the packaging? Hmm? I think it's kind of clean, it's transparent. You see what is inside? Um, it's same price as the other ones. I don't think it's more expensive. You can always buy it on Amazon.com. That's the only place you can buy them from, actually. They don't sell anywhere else. Um, and this is the last one I'm going to show you, I think. This is a very interesting company. And I know we videotape those presentations, so I have to be very careful what I say about it. What do you think of this? If you see that mayo is in a supermarket, what would you think? Just mayo. Very clean label. There is nothing on the label. <laughs> it's almost an empty label. 
Yeah, and I, I actually, the first observation I have to make is that just doesn't really make any reference to food. It's like something else, just. What is just? Just Eat, it's a company that started in 2011 in, in um, San Francisco. The first company that they made a mayonnaise with no egg. So it's egg-free mayonnaise, that's why they say just. And because of that, they were in trouble with all sorts of different companies. There was a lawsuit against them from uh, Unilever, big pro pro food manufacturer, obviously, and they make mayonnaise. The, they said the, the, the justification be behind the lawsuit was that you can't call something mayonnaise if it does not have eggs. And after a while, they dropped the lawsuit. I don't know why. During that time, though, in the media, there was a scoop from someone, I don't know who got it, a journalist or a newspaper, that the egg, the American Egg Association, American Egg Board, um, did not like the fact that they didn't, don't use eggs. So they were kind of trying to boycott them through government agencies, through a lot of emailing and letters and everything. So who, who could read all those letters? So food, food and politics, right? And the economy. And then what happened a couple of years ago, the company, um, it, it was very successful in theory, this is what everybody was saying. Everybody liked the mayo with no eggs. I actually got this, and it's, it's an interesting mayonnaise. It's very light, it doesn't have egg, obviously, but you, I, I liked it. Um, there were some other rumors from, um, actually no, Bloomberg Television, a journalist from Bloomberg um, announced, the f no, they did, they did not announce, they find out that in order to present to their investors, because everybody invests in that company, including Bill Gates, they all give them millions of dollars to go on and do whatever they do, plant-based food, that they were buying back their own product from shelves. They were recruiting people like you and me and everybody to go in all different supermarkets and buy massively, empty the shelves with their own products. And they, obviously, they refused it. They said, we didn't do, they denied that. We never did that. We sell because people like us. After that, their management board resigned, and now they're kind of trying to um, re, um, design themselves. They, they do pretty well, they produce other products, just this, just chocolate chip. I like the packaging, I hope the company is doing well, I hope that, that they don't cheat and they do what they have, they were inspired to do. If you go to their website, justate.com, you're gonna see videos how they produce food and so on. And hopefully they don't, uh, they, they tell the truth to people, to the consumers. Okay, next quiz. If you know the answer to this one, please prepare the vegans and the vegetarians in the audience not faint, to not faint the next three minutes. What is balut? What is ball in the egg? Yeah, it's a light, pretty much a fetus egg within the egg that you eat like this. I ate it and I liked it, but, and I want to see the little bird inside, the fetus, that you can see it. You see it very briefly and then you eat it because you don't want really to see what it is. It's a delicacy in the Philippines. I think it's very tasty. I don't think it's for everybody, but, um, you know, if you want to try something that is a little bit challenging, like, uh, haven't yet tried the fermenting, the fermenting shark here. I plan to. Yeah. Um, and now, I think I'm gonna, that's the website of that Just Eat. I'm gonna show you a package I brought. This one. So, what is this made from? Ah, oh, sorry. Bianitos. Can you guess? From beans, yes, beans. And this is the white bean mac and cheese crunch, baked. So what do you think of the packaging? Mm? Clean, not clean, easy? Mm? You like it? No? You don't like it? Yeah, I think I don't like the colors somehow, I don't know. Although the orange and yellow and red colors, they're all colors of appetite. Um, that's why all the fast food chains, they're kind of orangey, reddish. 
it's the color of food. And also the fast, it has an element of fastness, so you eat fast and then you go. Um, Mm. What it is, yeah, yeah. I, I think it has an element of confusion too. Um, you can understand maybe what they're ba made from. Also, they say white bean. I mean, I can open and try if you want to. I, I need the bag though. I need the plastic bag empty. You can try and tell me what you think at the end, the question time. Okay. <laughs> not now. Not start crunching down my munching everything. Um, we said in the beginning that there is also politics a little bit in the food. Um, we mentioned that. So now I'm going to show you. We have agencies, the egg board that they're fighting this company that they don't use eggs. We have FDA. We have all sorts of things. Um, in China, during the Cultural Revolution, they even changed the name of a dish. And this is from my. Uh, Website. It's a Tumblr thing. I have edibly.com, which is like um, a culinary dictionary. I try to, to post the word every Friday, and I studied that maybe a year ago, a year and a half. I think if I want to put all the words I want, I have to wait for maybe a few thousand years to finish everything. If I put only one word every Friday. So the Gao, um, the Gao Bao Jin Ding, which is the Kung Pao chicken, um, they had to change the name of it because this dish was named uh, after the late uh, King Dynasty governor of Sichuan, Ding uh, Baozhen, because he liked the dish so much. But because he was obviously, you know, uh, someone from the, um, being associated with the imperial governor, during the Cultural Revolution, the dish was labeled as politically incorrect. So they changed the name and they make it Hong Bao Jing Di until the 80s that they kind of went back to Kung Pao chicken. You know, you see all those things every day. A few years ago, I was reading an article about Korean, because the Korean cuisine is becoming very popular everywhere, with kimchi and bam bim bam and all those things. The, govern the government decided that all restaurants, they should describe their menus in English too, for people to know what they eat, you know. So there is an element of politics in the language of food. And, you know, that takes me to the next one. That the language of food can be simple, it can be wild, it can be easy, provocative, bold, redundant sometimes, as we saw, and unrelated to food, like just. What is just? It's just, just. I mean, you don't really think of food if you say just, right? I don't. What else it can be, the language of food? It can be very also uh, emotional, you have like an expression, oh, this is too expensive and too cheap or too bad, too good. So if you see the word organic in a package, I don't know if this is organic. Uh, no, it's not. What do you think if someone says to you, this is an organic bianitos or organic sandwiches that you have for lunch? What do you think of organic? Hmm? Expensive, one. Quality, quality better quality. Produced locally. Produce locally. Non-GMO, mm, yes and no. Environmental, yeah, all those things. You know, when companies were testing organic foods like five, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, that was the beginning, maybe 15, and they, they used to do focus groups. Most of the respondents, like the people, consumers that were taking part, they were saying that organic for them was associated with the planet Earth. It was like environmental friendly. It was all about protection of the Earth and save the Earth. So what they did, all those food manufacturers, and I found that very kitschy, they put the planet Earth on the package, like this, the little planet Earth. I, I don't think it was. So today, this is what exactly people think of organic, expensive, environmental friendly. There are some regulations to produce it. In the, in the US, it has to be USDA certified. It's healthier, it's more expensive, adds value. It's better than mainstream food. Would you pay the, do you think that the average consumer though will pay the money to buy organic food? Well, that depends on the country also, right? That depends on the country, that depends on the, uh, the income. Um, that depends on the product too. 
for example, there are certain foods, even if they're organic, they're still bad, like this. I don't care if this is organic, this is bad for you, because it's full of salt, you know. I don't care if it's an organic cheese or an organic bean, this is bad food, you know. So, uh, I don't care for organic bianitos, really. <laughs> but if it's an organic apple, or an organic, I don't know, organic fish, maybe. Um, so, closing, and we'll have time for questions and discussion, and eat bianitos. Um, the take away from polyglots, what we can use the language of food, you can use it to teach, you can become more aware of it, you can know how to read menus better, how to explain to your friends what they eat, uh, and everything else you want to do. I mean, I don't know, we can, some of you, maybe you translate food, you are translators of cookbooks and recipes and um, menus and everything. Um, you can use it as you want, um, but it's definitely there every day. I mean, the other day I was reading an article, I came to Reykjavik through London, and I got the Guardian and it was making a joke with the word, because in France there is a shortage of butter, so they had a title, I don't think I have it with me, Un beurre. So they were playing the word butter in French and English. So this, it, it's everywhere every day. And I'm gonna close with this one, which is fun. Again, from Australia, which I think it's very interesting uh, country in terms of food, and I like, I like it a lot, I like the Australian food. And look at this. It's a mango. Hmm? Sweet chicks. I like it. Australian KP, I don't know what the KP is. I probably think it's a location, maybe. And the 5928, probably um, a product, uh, product um, uh, code. And that's it for me. So now you can try that and tell me what you think. This is my email address, and edibly, if you want to. Oh, also, I have to tell you, I myself think that what I want to do, because people ask me, what are you going to do with this? I'm going to do a PhD? No, I don't. Um, um, I want to bring together the community of cookbook authors with translators of food. So I, ideally, I want to create a platform that they kind of collaborate. So I, books written, cookbooks written in different languages, not only English, right? Different languages from different parts of the world, small or big, and you know with translators at the same time, so we can work together. So if you want to get involved, give me your card. I don't plan to start anything until maybe February. So um, be in touch, you never know. Thank you. Thank and you love. very much, okay. there. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I'll try one. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Uh, Une question de mon... One. Question. On parle. Thanks a lot for the presentation. I mean, it was quite painful because now I'm very angry, <laughs> first of all. Yeah, especially if you've seen that menu from um, 11 Park Avenue, Madison Park. I'd like to say that maybe the language of food is very baroque, you know, it's full of masks and uh, mm. you have to dig deeper to find some kind of truth. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, when I was a kid, I used to go on uh, French markets. I saw a fish called la lotte. It was always presented at fillets, as mm -hmm. fillets, you know. Yeah. And it seems strange for me. So I went to see the Latin name of uh, la lotte. It's uh, Lotus Pescatorius. And it's a very ugly fish, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I asked the man at the market, he said the fish is so ugly that if he presents the fish um, enti entirely, he won't sell any uh, lot. Mm -hmm. so That's why they make yeah. it more. In fact, the, the real name of the fish is Baudroit Commune. So <laughs> they put a mask, they just yeah. change the fish, and they change the name as well. And you make it more beautiful. Yeah, so it's a kind of taboo. And I think uh, the language of, of food is also uh, related to taboos, a lot mm -hmm. of taboos, oh, yeah. Yeah. regarding what is aesthetic, what is uh, edible or not. Yeah, for, also. Yeah, for religious Yeah, and that's, this is what I want to say, yeah. for the religious, you yeah. see the, this package food there in America, all of them, they have the kosher sign for the um, uh, Jewish, who are 
eating kosher and some they have halal even for the Muslims. So religion comes also very often. Thank you. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ.